Spanning topics from legendary barbers to legendary pop stars, from the history of cheerleading to the history of pornography, from politics to movies, and from teenagers to senators, Richard Schenkman has documented the lives of people from every facet of American culture. I knew that Dave Stewart and Tom Petty, if they wrote a song together, it would be great. So I called Dave Stewart. It was great, because he came in right when we were kind of getting bogged down. You know? And he came in with a lot of good energy and a couple of good songs. And he played me this demo he'd done, you know, this little cassette thing, and uh, he'd used an electric sitar on it. And I said, yeah, I can dig this. And so we wrote the song in about 30 minutes, and then we were really pretty gay. That was uh, Don't Come Around Here No More. A lot of people were upset about the end of the Heartbreakers last video, Don't Come Around Here No More, where uh, our Alice character was sort of sliced up and served at the tea party, but it was really intended to be good fun, you know, uh, it wasn't meant to disturb anyone. I mean, our policy has always been um, to keep all the sex and violence in our videos behind the camera. Actually, when we were doing it, I thought it was hysterical. I thought it was funny. Um, everybody talking about how it's, you know, it's a kind of cruelty to women and that kind of stuff kind of shocks me. I don't know. I, I think it was, it, it's funny, you know, because if you know she's not in pain and you know it's cake and you watch it and you're still cringing and still getting disturbed, well, what do you, I mean, what, you ever think about the news? In 1979, Thousands of beautiful women from across America vied to be Playboy's 25th anniversary playmate. But there could be only one. The ultimate girl next door, Candy Loving. A new search produced the stunning 30th anniversary playmate, Penny Baker. In 1989, more women than ever turned out in hopes of being number 35. But only the sophisticated Fauna McLaren would be worthy of the honor. Now, over 10,000 women converge on 25 cities across the United States and Canada with only one thing in mind, the right to be called Playboy's 40th Anniversary Playmate. From Des Moines, Iowa to New York, New York, from the first Polaroids to revealing finalist fantasies, be a part of Playboy's 40th Anniversary Playmate Search. Listen up now, guess what? It is Playboy Magazine's 40th birthday, and to celebrate, they are searching for the perfect girl to be their 40th anniversary playmate. They wanted me, but you know what a shy little thing I am. So this is kind of exciting because we are the first TV show to actually be involved. The way we used to figure that out of 100 candidates, perhaps we called one back for a test, and probably out of the ones that we call back for a test, one in 10 will actually take to the next stage, which would be doing a centerfold. This girl looks awfully strong. I have a feeling that she might be one that we start a centerfold on right away. What do you think? The accomplishments of gentler souls were not lost in the tumult and shouting of 1968. The young American generation that took to the streets in protest found a sense of community and a means of expression in music, art, and clothing. There was a joyous freedom and diversity that ran the gamut from Simon and Garfunkel to the Rolling Stones. In Hollywood, there was a celebration of newly discovered artistic freedom. But even as such movies as Bonnie and Clyde, The Graduate, and Cool Hand Luke were honored at the Academy Awards, Oliver, a traditional musical, was a box office smash. And the motion picture rating system, which classified films as everything from G to X, was instituted as a safeguard against censorship. The late 60s brought male nudity and simulated sex, which translated to no exposure of male genitals. Porno houses started springing up. Then in 1972, everything changed when the ultra-explicit Deep Throat burst onto the screen. It ran for over 15 years. Carnal classics such as The Devil and Miss Jones, Behind the Green Door, and Debbie Does Dallas changed the meaning of the term adult film. They were big budget. In fact, some of the movies that I did were up at, you know, half a million, quarter million dollars. I mean, it was big budget. It was like real movie making, 
real crews. I mean, it was, a, it was very much like Hollywood. It was the early 80s, and producers, talent, and theaters were flourishing. But that changed quickly, thanks to a bit of technology called... Video. The video market has overtaken the uh, theatrical market for adult film because everything would be uh, rented these days. I'm Joe Sorello, the one who invented the DA haircut, which I'm going to perform now on this gentleman, which I started in 1937. And this is the way it's being done. We're going to make a canal back here and then flop this over both sides so we'll meet and it will look something like this. I love Joseph to death, and we come down maybe once or twice a week just to see him. And every time you leave, he says, now you look just like a movie star. I practiced on a blind boy, and I took advantage of him. Mm -hmm. Means I know he couldn't see what I was doing. <laughs> and from that day on, it became word of the mouth from South Philadelphia High School where all the kids were going to Dick Clark's bandstand. And that's when it became big. You couldn't go to the bandstand unless you had a DA. They could be the supergroup of 1986. Eddie Van Halen on guitar, John Taylor on bass, Howard Jones on keyboards, and Phil Collins on drums. I've seen John Taylor grow, which is really interesting. The first time I met him, they were the opening band for Blondie at, out of the Meadowlands. And John, in those days, was barely competent. Now I've just played with him, and he's the kind of guy that I'd be proud to have in a band. I always wanted to be a guitarist, because lead guitarists get more girls. Everybody knows that. And um, so I didn't even pick up a bass until I had good times at Sheep. And uh, so that record kind of changed my life. Leoness Mosife was the most eminent designer of bridges in the world. He either designed or helped to design practically every major bridge in North America. The climax of his career was to be the Tacoma Narrows Bridge on the Puget Sound in Washington State. The Tacoma Narrows would be narrower, shallower, and lighter than any suspension bridge yet built, a real tour de force. But Mosife finally went a bridge too far. From the day it opened, July 1st, 1940, there was something a little strange about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. At times, motorists saw the car in front of them appear to sink into the roadway. At other times, it appeared to vanish completely. No one was alarmed. Engineers explained to each other the advantages of the flexible suspension design. Some stays were added to give it a bit more rigidity. Meantime, motorists enjoyed the roller coaster sensation. They even gave the bridge a nickname, Galloping Gertie. And Gertie was a hit. Toll receipts ran many times higher than anticipated. Mosife was delighted. On November 7th, 1940, with just a normal wind blowing, Gertie started to sway violently. A few minutes later, the violent swaying tore loose some struts, and a 600-foot section of the bridge fell into Puget Sound. Hello, I'm Fred Weinberg, and I compose music and create sound effects. The most important thing for me is, is um, for somebody to understand the concept. I think that there are probably people that can do great sound effects, but um, I think where Fred is really good is that he understands the concept. Okay, now I'd like to show you the uh, recording studio where I do most of my work. This is a uh, cueca from Brazil, and it's used as a percussion instrument, sometimes to imitate a cacao. <laughs> right here we have the gato drums, which are tuned uh, wooden drum. <laughs> Moving right along, we have, which is obvious, bongos and maracas, which were sent to me from my family in Colombia. Right here we have a uh, carol on. Jimmy, tell me about your concept here. What, what's the general idea of the spot? Okay, this one is a wimpy type of guy, and he's, the strategy is the hard, the hard gum. So uh, he puts the gum in his mouth, he attempts to chew, the gum is very hard, he has difficulty chewing. As that's happening, the sound effect of the car should happen where the car tries to start. 
He tries to start the gun. They both fail. He finally gets it going. The car turns over, and he's chewing away, and the car is humming happily. What I'm about to do here is record the engine of this uh, Saab, which I feel has a great sound for the bazooka gum commercial. I take one engine, trying to start. Car running and uh, ob obtaining chewing effects. And cut.